Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance uh, Network and Conscious Resistance YouTube channel. Um, so today we have Dana Martin, who is a radical unschooler and a advocate for natural childbirth. Uh, she's written two books, one on um, unschooling, one on childbirth. And um, I think she has a lot of uh, awesome things to say about parenting that we should all listen to and understand. So, um, so Dana, why don't we uh, start off, uh, I guess it's a good place, uh, how did you become an anarchist? I'd like to, <laughs> we'd like to start well, off. Well, the interesting thing is I never knew that I was an anarchist. I, I've been living an anarchist lifestyle, I guess you could say, from the beginning. But it wasn't until I met Jeff Berwick and Stefan and, and a lot of these amazing people interviewed me that I realized that, wow, I've been doing this all along. I just didn't know what it was called. So I guess I'm a natural anarchist. I came to this because it makes sense. I've been, this is how I live my life. Um, and this is how I parent. So the anarchist uh, philosophy, I guess you could say, is just ingrained in who I am. So I, I've been an anarchist, but I didn't know it until recently. <laughs> Excellent. I guess that's the best type of anarchist, right? You didn't, yeah. have to, you didn't have to learn about it. You just are. <laughs> well, I think it's a really natural way to live, actually. This this perspective and mindset is uh, the most natural way. When you live in partnership with people and you don't try to control them and there's no punishment, which is how we parent, mm -hmm. um, it makes much, much more peaceful, lot, you know, for peaceful lives and meets everybody's needs. So. so so, who was the primary influence for you in developing your parenting style? Um, my kids, my son, my, who's 15, definitely. Um, I didn't have an influence any more than, than him or listening to my heart. I, I believe that this lifestyle of peaceful parenting is the most natural, instinctual way to live. So it, I listened to him. I, I wasn't fearful when he was born in the sense of uh, I tuned out all the advice I got around to me from <laughs> well-intended parent, you know, parents, in-laws, um, doctors. I just listened to my son. And when he cried, I picked him up and I held him and nursed him whenever he wanted to eat. He slept close to me at night. I never separated him in a crib because he wanted to be with me and on me. And I listened to him from the beginning. And then much like my awareness of being an anarchist, I came to the awareness that, wow, this has a label. It's called attachment parenting. And um, then it went on to unschooling. So this all comes natural to me. And labels, I think, are very helpful to kind of clarify what you're doing. However, again, this is the most natural and instinctual way to live for me. You're such a rebel. <laughs> I know, right? It, it, isn't that weird how, you know, we, we, like you said, you know, when my son was crying, I picked him up. When he was hungry, I nursed him. Like, how can that be considered um, revolutionary, right? <laughs> I know, but it is. The amazing thing is there are, uh, so many people were resistant to me parenting that way. Now, I think that's uh, for many reasons. I think I triggered them and that they maybe wanted to parent that way, but were too fearful and they were warned against it. Uh, people around me told me that if I held my son too much, he would manipulate me and he'd become too dependent on that oh, and that yeah. he needed to learn to soothe himself and he needed to learn um, that I wasn't always going to rush to his aid and, and everything that people were telling me made no sense. Um, children are meant to be dependent and when you meet their dependent needs, they become independent uh, much more authentically and sooner than kids who are denied mm -hmm. what they're asking for. Yeah, like even even uh, uh, breastfeeding, you know, for you know, mammals have been breastfeeding for how many you know millions of years, and then you know, in the in the in the twentieth century, you have pediatricians say, you know what, I think formula is better, <laughs> and only now are most pediatricians like changing, right? Now I think it's uh, according to the. American Pediatric Association, I think now they're recommending breastfeeding again. <laughs> Rest before, right. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, I think a lot of it's just so based in fear that, that doctors think if they can regulate or see how much a baby's getting, then that's a healthier way to be able to uh, raise them. But it's not. I think, again, it comes back to trust and listening to your instinct. And I always trusted my babies were getting enough milk. I was a La Leche League leader for many years. I did breastfeeding counseling and... That's kind of what started everything for me, actually, as an advocate, is becoming a breastfeeding counselor and supporting women to trust their babies and pick up their babies when they cried and hold them as much as they wanted to be held. And it just naturally led to the other forms of advocacy that I do. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that you mentioned was kind of interesting is I hear that a lot, too, is, you know, don't nurse them. They're just going to get hooked on you. Don't hug them too much. They're just going to get hooked. on. Don't don't sleep with them. They're just going to they're never going to leave your bed. 
<laughs> don't yeah, you, don't, you don't want them dependent on love because that would be a bad thing. <laughs> no. If they expect to be loved, you love them too much, they're going to expect it. And <laughs> what would happen? You know, that would be awful. <laughs> you, you note my sarcasm. I, I, posted, <laughs> I, I posted an article recently on my, on my Facebook profile about, um, what do you call that, self-soothing? You know, and 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 they describe these people that that just leave. They they say you're supposed to just put your baby down. You know, like nine o'clock, and then come back in twelve hours. You know, and just ignore. And so most of the, and so some of the times the baby cries so much that they vomit, right? And they you know and they're drenched in sweat. And so the pediatrician they say, okay, you can clean up the vomit, but just don't show your love. Like don't show any affection or any emotion while you clean up the vomit. Just. And, you know, you can change them, too, because they're drenched, right? But just leave them. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, it's really scary, actually. That kind of advice freaked me out. Uh, I, I didn't – I thought it was so detached um, and did not at all meet the needs of me as a mother to nurture my child. It was very fear-based. So I think a lot of parenting advice, whether it's for babies or older children or teenagers, is so fear-based. And that's our cultural mindset. I'd like to explain that to people, that when you recognize uh, your – approaching something with a mindset of fear, it's usually not the way to go about it. You want to get back in your trusting space and connect with your child. Uh, the interesting thing is my kids, we co-slept with all of them. Two of them still we co-sleep with um, by choice. And they left the family bed when they were ready, for example. And they're very independent. As I was telling you before, my son Devin, when he was 14, he went to Peru for five weeks. He had no issue. He didn't call me bawling, crying that he missed me. He just had a great time. He was in the moment and <laughs> he came cool. home and I mean, this parenting works in the sense of um, people might say, what do you mean it works? Well, it depends on your goal. I think with a lot of mainstream parenting, it's very, very focused on the parent's needs. So in the examples you were giving with the crib and, you know, just cleaning up the vomit, but don't show love. That's a very narcissistic approach to parenting um, and a very authoritarian approach to parenting that it meets the needs of the parents only. The parents needs for quiet, uninterrupted sleep and obedience. And when that is the goal, yeah, that kind of parenting works awesome if that's the goal, but it's very, very uh, damaging to human beings. And it warps their connection with their parent. It warps them for life. It makes them very, very um, neurotic. Neurotic parenting, it should be called. Um, but most people don't know. They don't look at it that way. So um, a lot has to change in our culture to get to this awareness that children's needs matter too. Mm -hmm. So parenting from a place of partnership <clears throat> it doesn't mean that you're letting the pendulum swing in the other direction to be from totally parent-led to totally child-led. Um, this is about family-led and finding ways to meet the needs of everybody in the family equally. And that is the important uh, piece to add to this. Yeah, and I think a lot of people uh, look at parenting like, uh, I like the way Stefan Molyneux describes it. He says, um, they, they say, it's me plus my child, right? <laughs> but it more, more often should be, you know, more your child plus you, right? Like they think it's going to be, my life is going to be the same. I'm just going to have another child. <laughs> Not, nothing's going to change with my life, right? Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's, you know, people, they don't want to, they don't want to uh, shift, you know, their mindset at all. You know, they, they don't want to think that, you know, this is a developing life and I'm going to have, to, I'm in charge of this life and it didn't choose to be my child. You know, nobody, nobody really thinks like that. And, uh, and then, and then we wonder why the, you know, we grow up with so much societal and institutionalized violence that people are like, you know, where did that come from? I don't, I don't, I don't understand how, <laughs> how people are like, right? Right, it's passed down, too. I mean, if there was no internet, it was a lot different when our parents had kids because the information and support that they had was basically their neighbor and their mother, you know, and the doctor. And so it must have been a really hard way mm -hmm. to uh, raise your kids. Luckily, we had the internet. So when I started parenting off the beaten path, <laughs> I found support and I found other people that were doing it. And when you have support and community, it can really be empowering. So I really wanted to be that for people. The, the older my kids have gotten, the stronger I've gotten in this belief. And I see the results of parenting with uh, peace and trust and connection. And I want to empower people that they don't have to be afraid and they don't have to be afraid to give their child too much love because you d could never ruin somebody <laughs> with too much love like our culture <laughs> says. Can you, can you explain uh, your, your unschooling style, your, your, your type of... Uh... Sure. Yeah, it is basically doing what I've done from the beginning with my kids. I've always trusted them. They didn't have to have classes to learn to walk and talk. We didn't sign them up for a little baby boot camp and, and give them tests on it and train with it and 
um, you know, undermine their natural ability, uh, we parent in a way that trusted them from the beginning and it's just extended every year that they've gone on. We parent in a place of partnership. So our children have never been punished. They've never been grounded. They've never had toys taken away. They've never been threatened. Um, it doesn't mean that it's constant bliss around here. We have issues come up, but we deal with them in a peaceful way that respects them and meets their needs and our needs too. So um, we live in such a way where we kind of put everybody's needs on the table and we talk about them and find peaceful solutions. So this philosophy is something that if you really want to learn about, it takes time. Well, the hardest part about this philosophical perspective isn't for the kids. The kids, this is natural to them. This is the most instinctual, natural way for them to live. Kids are natural born learners and they learn and grow and come into this world wanting to be like good people. I mean, we all, when you have positive in intent, it's very, very different than the way we were raised where, where there was like a cultural overtone of negative intent was assumed from us. So um, this is knowing that my kids are doing the best they can all the time with what they know and their ability and their you know, emotional growth and so forth. But it's also healing because there's so many things that are triggered when we have kids from our own upbringing or like a cultural upbringing. And it's profoundly healing to be able to like do what should have been done for you. It, it really, you can, uh, but I think it's important not to come from a place or live in a space of anger or blame. Um, because I also believe that my parents did the best they could with what they knew at the time and who they were. So um, I don't sit in a place of anger for them. For me, there is, I don't talk to my father, so I totally get it from that perspective. He has many issues and he's an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. But with my mother, um, I feel better in connection with her and focusing on the needs under her behavior, mm -hmm. just like I do my kids, and respecting that. So I think you have to like find the people that fully support what your core beliefs are on this path and take what works and leave the rest. So not everybody's going to agree with everything I say, but maybe there's a little nugget of information or support you can gain from this perspective and I could support you with. So, you know, w One thing I find is interesting when I explain um, the way I want to parent, you know, because I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, so the way I want to raise my kids is, um, you know, is a choice that I've made because of the things I've learned, right? And unfortunately, especially with family, <clears throat> when you tell them that, they uh, they take it as a personal attack on the way they raised. <laughs> I know me, it right? comes up a lot. It comes up a lot, and I think those are the relationships that are never work. You know, like those are the relationships that you have to turn away from. Like with my father, for example, I haven't spoken to him for seven years because he had that attitude and was very judgmental. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband's mother was very much the same in her reaction to how we parented. My mother was a little more open to it in the sense of she was like, wow, if I knew then what you knew, man, I would have done that for sure. You know, I'm sorry that it didn't work out like that for you, but I fully support you. That's a different perspective, I think, to have. And it just depends on the parent and the situation, but it profoundly affects you, doesn't it? Like when you're judged by family. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and yet the other thing you mentioned was, um, you know, about how, how kids are always learning. And, and, and so the way I try to, um, you know, talk to my son he's he's four and a half right but i i try to you know reason with him and and ex explain things as much as possible right because he's at the the point where he's asking all these questions like you know he has questions like you know how do robots make clothes how do robots make <laughs> uh, shoes how do robots make food how do how does rice crackers you know what what's all these things you know how are they made right and you know if i'm at a computer i show him a video right but i but i can i usually explain it but uh, I think that's the best time, you know, when you respond to those questions. That's, that's education right there because they're ready and they're receptive to new information, right? And so that's the perfect time to, to talk, you know. Um, so <laughs> that's when I feel like I'm really, they're learning something, right? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of talk about from experts and parenting experts and doctors that you don't want to miss that window of readiness. And they always pretend to know better than the child. It's really interesting that between five and a half and six, six years and one month old is the only time to teach reading because they'll, <laughs> it's ridiculous the way we approach it. Our kids show us their window of readiness. It's not this big guessing game. It doesn't have to be difficult. Exactly what you said. When your kids are asking you, they're ripe and ready to learn. So you need, but, but this type of life is not for the lazy parent, as you know. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, when they hear the term unschooling, they think it's like not educated and very hands-off and it, I've even heard it called unparenting which is completely oh, false shoot. yeah it's interesting yeah, it has awesome. such a well because the label itself is kind of negative you know unschooling I think people just don't understand it's important to realize that unschooling is not doing school 
yeah. not living life under like like schools live. It's living life as though school doesn't exist. I'm not going to force my child to learn things that they have no interest in. Mm -hmm. um, so that window of readiness is when they tell you exactly. So you have to like jump on it. You have to be ready to facilitate their learning and give them as many resources as possible. I've had my kids ask me things like like you're saying your son asked, and we've gone to visit. Like there was a sausage factory when we went to visit because my son wanted to know one night how sausages were made. So I knew there was one in our town. The next morning, I called up and asked if he can go in there and check it out and they were awesome so we did um yeah so this can be really fun to parent by uh nurturing their interests and passions but you have to have a lot of energy yeah, for sure <laughs> yeah, yeah i think a lot of people yeah well you're right when they hear the term unschooling or homeschooling even they think that you're just like you know locking your kid in a room throwing books at him <laughs> well a lot of people do like that's the interesting thing isn't it like 90 percent, if not more now of parents homeschool they do exactly what schools do, but they do it at home. Really? And they don't. Wow. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, the percentage of unschoolers, and this was probably five years ago. There was a study. It was like 1% of homeschoolers were unschoolers. I have no idea what that is now hmm. um, because there are so many unschoolers that are underground. Hmm. You know, there, there's a lot of people that don't report to the state. There's a lot of people that just kind of do their own thing. I, I fully support whatever anybody decides. I, being a very public figure, go totally by the state's rules because, you know, I'm out there and but so it's really hard to get an accurate count on who's unschooling. Yeah, yeah. Because people jump through the hoops they need to to do it for legality <laughs> and so forth. How do you go according to the state? Like there's is there quarterly exams or No, no. New Hampshire's awesome. Is you basically yeah. I mean it used to be pretty regulated. I was so surprised that we called ourselves the live free or die state for a lot of years because it was one of the most regulated states up until two thousand twelve. We, I had to hire an evaluator, um, but I'd hire an unschooling-friendly evaluator, a mother who's unschooling her kids who was a former teacher and worked for the state because they understand how this life works. Uh, unschooled kids learn just as much as kids in school. So this isn't about like jumping through ho hoops so your kids don't have to do anything. You have to understand how children naturally learn and how to translate what your kids are doing every day through pursuing their passions and interests into like what we call schoolies. You have to translate it into like school language. Mm -hmm. So it's completely um, accurate and viable and plenty of learning is happening. It's just a lot of, it's not done traditionally. It's not done through workbooks. It's not done through, you know, testing your kids. It's done through trust and being connected and being present and taking notes and writing down what they're doing. Um, and so that that's one of the reasons I started my blog like 10 years ago was to keep track of what they were doing so I could translate it into learning that schools would understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so you, just, you, so you just write down like what they learned in a year or something like that? Yeah, we, I'd write down what they did every day because okay. kids learn as a side effect of pursuing their passions. So yeah, for example, yeah. for example, we don't break our life down into subjects. Um, we live life without compartmentalizing. We never say, this is science, this is English, this is math. <laughs> I've no, I wouldn't be saying that to you right now. It's ridiculous that kids that have to live like that, mm -hmm. actually. But, um, However, I would, if you were to break our life down into subjects, I would take an interest like my son, when he was your son's age, loved Legos. He was passionate about Legos. Um, so I said, well, how can I bring as much of this interest into his life as possible to learn and grow from? We subscribed to Lego magazine for him. There was the written word. He was internally motivated to learn to re he wanted to know what it said. Um, we brought him to a Lego exhibit in Manchester, New Hampshire, three hours away, like the biggest Lego exhibit in the world. Like we started a Lego club so we could be around other kids that loved it. There was so much we did to nurture that passion and interest. So if you were to break it down into subjects, you would see, oh, we made a Lego cake, for example. So that's math. That's math. That's, that's yeah, we did. It was really cool. That's, that's math. Great. That's science. That's, I mean... Uh, reading and writing through the magazine and through his correspondence. So when I, I would have to break it down into schoolies language, all of which was true and accurate, but I just had, you know what I mean? I had to translate it for schools mm -hmm. and the evaluator to understand mm -hmm. how my son learned. And <clears throat> there's a lot of unschooling friendly evaluators that are very, very evolved and they understand true learning. And mm -hmm. so you have to find those people though, if you're trying to jump through those hoops. Yeah, there's a great uh, a quote that I, I say often to people, which is, um, if a child does not want to learn, um, nothing will convince him. If a child wants to learn, nothing will stop him. There's, when a child has a passion to learn something, you know, y y you do. You, you want to nurture and, and nourish that, right? Because you don't know where that's going to lead, right? And that's, that's really what true education is, when, when they follow that path. where They have no idea where it's going to go. And I, I guess that frightens a lot of people who are... Who are so used to the, uh, you know, um, structure of, of public school, you know, like I was too. 
Um, and there's so many layers to peel away with it all as to why people are fearful. I mean, for one, you were told to jump through those hoops, and a lot of people think that putting their kids in school or buying a curriculum is guaranteed success, or it's covering themselves somehow. Mm-hmm. It's like a safety net, but in fact, it's damaging. And if you could be trusting and open and ambitious enough to trust your children, they go on to be amazing human beings. And my son is a Devon's 15. He is a master blacksmith and a bladesmith. Wow. He's a fire twirler, and it's interesting because he was, I know he teaches people how to twirl fire, which is, like, so unique. So going back to when he was three, uh-huh. him coming up to me and saying, Mama, I want to light a match. Um, <laughs> me saying, okay, well, let's do this. Let's do it safely. Let's go down to the wood stove. And I sat in front of that wood stove uh, nursing my daughter, Tiffany, while he lit matches and threw them into the wood stove for hours and hours on end. I would sit at the kitchen table with him uh, by his side while he lit candles to make sure it was safe. So... A lot of parents in that one example, I'm kind of just sharing this one example to prove a point, are very fearful of these things and they'll forbid their kids these certain things because either they don't feel like sitting there or they think it's dangerous or the number of reasons. But when you take the time to meet their needs for curiosity, Devin wouldn't be a blacksmith. Too. Look at his passion for fire when he was three has led to him being a bladesmith. I mean, he, he's an entrepreneur. He has his own business and what he does is very, very unique. Um, and I contribute this to his freedom and respect. So... Yeah, kids go on that we all are meant to do uh, something unique in life. We're not all meant to learn the same things. So when, when you have the freedom to pursue your skills and passions, boy, can you individualize that educational experience for your kids. Yeah, I think another, another aspect that's, um, that's rendering our um, you know, public schools and government in general irrelevant is technology. Right, the internet and wireless technology, cell phones, you know, and iPods, iPads, all that kind of stuff. Because that just, I think that's just opening up a whole new way of learning, right? That uh, makes it so much easier for kids to to do things and you know learn how to read. And you know, when people tell me, you know, you're, how's your kid gonna learn how to read or write <laughs> without going to school? And, and the way I look at it is, how can they not? When you have all of this, you know, iPads, I've, all this stuff, they of course they're gonna learn. They it's out of necessity. They have to learn. They're gonna teach themselves, you know. Well, because people want to learn. Like, what human being wouldn't want to learn reading, writing, or math to help them get more of what they want in life? They're just tools to help us get more of what we want. And the only time somebody wouldn't want to learn them is if it was forced upon them or the instruction that was given was boring as hell and not even conducive to their type of learning. My son, Devin, learned to read through playing video games, through playing RuneScape. He learned um, because he had an internal motivation to really want to know what these other players were saying to him. And he had this internal drive to communicate. He never did a workbook page. He's never, he doesn't even know what phonics is. He, um, but he reads and writes now above his uh, level, I guess, if he was to be measured. My daughter, Tiffany, the same thing. She learned, uh, and it's a very different process when a child learns to read naturally. Um, I think that a lot of people think by age six or seven they're supposed to be reading, but that's, again, uh, school brainwashing that takes place because the teachers have to have the kids all reading by second grade because everything's in the written word after that. It'd be way too hard to individually focus on these students in class who weren't quite there yet. So Mm -hmm. the ones that can't keep up are labeled and drugged Mm -hmm. and told that that's their, like, issue and their fault or their problem when, in fact, it's it's not. It's really damaging. Natural reading happens anywhere between the age of 5 and 15. It's a huge 10-year window. It's enormous, and that's scary for people to hear, man. I'll tell you. I mean, I'd say average for the people I've worked with, and I've worked with hundreds of couples um, with parenting, coaching, with unschooling for many years now, is probably around 10 or 11. Between 9 and 11 seems to be average natural reading. My daughter Tiffany, the first book she ever read was a, almost a 300-page biography of the band One Direction, and it was geared for, an, for a 15-year-old. It was like reading age was 15. So she skipped. She didn't, like, she wasn't behind at all because she didn't, you know, not even close because yeah. she started later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So awesome. I think yeah, yeah. it's kind of, it's weird to say, my, but it's true, and... It's, but it takes a lot of trust, mm-hmm. definitely. Parents get really scared when their kids aren't reading by age eight. They I start to get the calls, like, what am I going to do? And it's, yeah. <laughs> so. I, I think, you know what I love about volunteerism is, is that, you know, the, 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 simple, the simple principle that, um, you know, it's never, it's never correct to initiate force, right? Force is... If if you have to use force for something, then your idea is worthless, right? <laughs> so, and yeah. that's what that's what public education and you know anything related to government is all about is force, right? And so that that's the basic idea that I approach, you know, parenting and um, you know why you know no 
no spanking, no corporal punishment, no, you know, all this kind of stuff. It just comes down to force, you know. Do you want to teach your kids that force is the way you solve problems? Or do you want to teach them that, you know, we're reasoning human beings that, that perhaps live differently than the beasts for a good reason, right? Mm-hmm. You know? Exactly. It takes effort for people. It is a lot more work to live this way. I always tell people rules are a replacement for being there. Rules and punishments are easy parenting. That's lazy parenting, not unschooling. And I think it really makes ruffles people's feathers because it hits them deep um, in that realization that, that it's easy for me to force my child to do things. However, in the long run, it's very detrimental, damaging because um, the connection in our relationship with my kids is the most influential that trust that they have for me as young as I can remember we had such a trusting relationship that when I would give them information they would appreciate it and they would understand it and respect it before we went into a grocery store I'd let them know hey you know just so you know there's no this type of store doesn't appreciate running we have to respect the store we go in here um, and they would turn to me and and they wouldn't um, want to rebel against that they understood that I was there to help them get what they want and give them information so uh, when you threaten and punish, whole different dynamic comes to play. It's not oh, even yeah. the same thing. Oh yeah, <clears throat> and I, and I also uh, bring up the broken window fallacy. Are you, are you familiar with this? It's uh, I love using this because it's when people tell me, um, "Well, look at you. You went to public school and you turned out okay." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, did I? Did I really turn out okay? Do you want to hear my teenage years and my early 20s? Because I'll tell you. I'm and, always and, doing inner work. And to me, that's kind of like, you know, justifying an immorality. Uh, yeah. if, you, if you gain success later in life, you know, it, it kind of rash, you know, rationalizes the immorality. It's like saying, you know, you were physically abused as a child, but look at you. You turned out okay. You're a successful business person. <laughs> so what does that mean? That it was good? <laughs> you know, whatever was done, the immoral act of for you know applying force in my life, of course not. <laughs> so it, it so it's always you know the seen and the unseen. You know they see how you are today in the present moment, but they don't see what was destroyed, the potential that was annihilated because up. because of the force that was, um, you know, brought into play in your education or you know just in in parenting that that you got so. <laughs> You, you yeah, get that also? I think it's a way for people that, yeah, oh yeah, all the time. Like people, I mean, I got it when my kids were babies and they'd be breastfed. Like, oh, you, you were fed formula and you're fine. It's oh, like, well, how, how do you know I was fine? I actually had a lot of illnesses growing up that could have very much been contributed to my vaccinations and my formula feeding and smoking and drinking by my parents. And, you know, people just don't know. I think you can focus on the positive of any outcome, of course. You know, our downfalls as parents will could be one of two things to our kids. It could either they could either repeat our mistakes or history or they it could empower them. You know, it could um make them not want to be like you. I don't want to do things in life uh so my kids don't want to be like me. I wanna just model for them uh that everyone's needs matter. And it really just comes down to that. That that if children learn what they live, which our culture chews up and spits out all the time, no one ever really thinks about what that means. If children learn what they live, then using power and force and punishments shows them that power rules. So of course they're going to go on to treat other people that way. Um, how we teach peace, kindness, and love is to model that to them, and their needs matter. So um, I, it's fascinating to me that people think this is so controversial i do interviews all the time and people are blown away with like i mean these are like mainstream interviews like for television shows or whatever where people just can't wrap their heads around kindness it's like <laughs> you can't wrap your head around kindness and love to another human being what is happening in our culture yeah <laughs> or, or what has happened what has been exactly, happening what, exactly. what has been happening for centuries right yes so i love coming together with people like you because you get it, and it's so rare to make these connections where you can be yourself and just you understand it. And we can say to each other, I can't believe we're the weirdos in this world. What's wrong with the people? It's yeah, crazy. It's just like John, John Lennon, right? He's like when, you know, when, the, when you're sane, but, you, but because insane people are in power, you're considered insane and, you know, <laughs> labeled as insane and locked up. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but also another, another interesting uh, way I approach it is um, the way – Stefan Molyneux puts it, which is, um, you know, your children were not chosen to be your children, right? And so basically, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, in a sense, you can say they're prisoners, right? And they have no choice in the matter. 
So then wouldn't you want to give them the best possible childhood that they, that they could ever imagine? And, and if, there were, if they did have a choice between other parents, that they would want to willingly choose you, right? I love that Steph says that. He, he's amazing. He's reaching so many people with peaceful parenting that I applaud him and respect him so much for this. I love that analogy because it's so important to realize, and I think it can come into play when you're helping other people understand this parenting. For example, a chores, that's a big one that comes up all the time, especially with people with kids my age, um, enforcing chores. And I say that uh, it's my need to have a clean house. It's my need to have it at this level of cleanliness that if my kids had a choice or my husband had a choice, maybe my 13-year-old daughter would want it to be at the level I am so she helps me. But I don't, I don't force my kids to do chores. They've never, ever been forced. We've never had charts with stickers. However, they're willingly, if, if I ask my son, hey, can you go to the dishwasher? He's more, he's more than willing to help, but he has the freedom and choice to say no. I'm busy, always, just like my husband. So um, most of the time, they willingly help out if I need it. But I take full responsibility of the level of cleanliness that I want. So, But that's hard for people. They have a hard time without that force of chores. They think kids are going to grow up and... Never learn how to clean, but mm -mm. it's not true. <laughs> I, I I used to tell people I, I don't know if this is um, if, what you think of this that that um, being a parent is like a triangle, right? And you can only have two you can only have two sides of the triangle. You can either your sanity, a clean house, or kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. and and so people they they get um, very stressed out or frustrated when you know they have little children and their just house just falls apart. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean it's one of those things that you just uh, most people are working all day. They're away from their homes. Their kids are in school all day, and, and they're just doing these things for this home that's like a museum. My home is not a museum of our things, which most people live like it's a museum of their things. Our house is a workshop of our interests. So the intent for the use of our home is very different than most people. So of course it's going to look like a workshop sometimes. Um, and it really ebbs and flows with what mood you're in. As a human being, we spend so much time in our house living this life that sometimes I'm really ambitious and the house looks awesome. <laughs> and other times it's just like I have too much going on or it's, or it's messier than usual. So it ebbs and flows. It's never really constantly one way. It just reflects our interests or passions at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think a, a lot of people they look at public school um, sometimes as like a, a daycare. <laughs> you know, like I have work. You know, my husband has work. Just he goes to public school. That's what everybody everybody just that's that's the routine, right? Um, and then it's, and, and to me that that's again it seems like you know you're you're you have a child, but you don't really want to spend time with your child. You just want to stick him somewhere. <laughs> and other people, have, you know, have other people raise them, and especially you know when you have the government raise them. Like, what kind of quality? What kind of quality do you expect your kid to come out of? You know, anything to do with government? Like, <clears throat> that just like is just amazing. So, <laughs> yeah, I have friends. Uh, my brother actually owns like a general contracting company, and I always think to myself this analogy that I don't sub out my parenting. I don't sub out my uh, upbringing mm -hmm. for my kids to other people. No way. I do it myself, which is the most authentic. A connected way um, and that's what my kids want too so I respect their choice to want to be with us as parents so that's a big aspect of it is not just upbringing but your kids and their decision and their choice who they want to be with kids don't want to spend their time with strangers you know just focused on obedience and control that don't love them I, I can't even imagine being around somebody that doesn't authentically love me kids want to learn from people who love them and are invested in their well-being um, and so that's another whole component that sh people never respect, uh, it seems like, is their kid's choice. Yeah, yeah, definitely not. Um, <laughs> it reminds me of a, uh, a cartoon. You see um, a, a mother and then, the, and then the child comes home from the first day of school and the child looks like really horribly, uh, you know, depressed and sad. And the, and the mother says, she says, don't worry, give it 12 years. You, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that. That's awesome. I love you know? that one. I think it takes, I mean, wouldn't you agree that it, it takes tapping into your memory of what it was like for you as a child? And that is really painful for some people. But really think about how you felt when you went to first grade. Think about what it was like to be um, told that you had to raise your hand to go to the bathroom and then denied it or... Um, the way you were spoken to or embarrassed or ridiculed. I mean, there's so much level of disrespect that it might be painful to tap into your memories from your school experience, but it's important because you have to learn from how you felt back then, I think. That's been a huge aid to me. Yeah, and some people who, yeah, I asked that too. I said, how was your 
How was your experience in public school? Do you seriously, did you seriously enjoy it and would you want that for your children? Um, and if you do, and if you didn't enjoy it, but you still want it for your children, doesn't that make you like some kind of a sadist? <laughs> you know? Well, people, it could because it takes, it's so deep, man. It just takes people, when you have to face that what you went through was damaging, it's hard for people. It's like takes inner work and healing and nobody wants, nobody it seems like in this culture wants to do that. Like, unfortunately, there are those people that are on the path to healing and do yoga and really want that inner growth and self-healing, but sometimes it's too much work for people. They don't have time. So by denying that it was negative and it, denying that it was painful, that it damaged them, um, is the easiest way to, for them. And so they, if they put their kids in school, it's like denying. It's total denial of what they went through. And that's the issue for a lot of people. Yeah, I think, I think um, the most honest... Um evaluation of of your own you know of our upbringing and childhood is if you went through something and you came to the conclusion that it was you know immoral or unnecessary and then you chose not to that's one of the most honest conclusions you can make is that you know you do not want your children to experience what you experienced because you you know considered it to be harmful right exactly so, children are naturally good people in the sense of morals and values they come into this world pure and just they don't even know what it means to be dishonest or manipulative and that is what grows within us when we're put in a situation where our needs aren't respected I, I never wanted to cheat on tests in school however my senior year I did because I had to pass to go do what I wanted to do I remember how awful I felt by writing the answers to every country's state every country's capital <laughs> I was in this college level course and I was petrified and I had to pass this or I would have stayed back I was forced in my mind to uh, turn into a cheat and a manipulator mm -hmm. and somebody dishonest how many times did I lie to save my ass in certain situations because I didn't want to get in trouble hmm. being in a situation that is very unhealthy and against your will morphs you into somebody who you don't like and don't want to be so then in turn it turns you the self-esteem goes so far down and you, you change. You change as a human being. And so that's something I've never seen with my children or other unschoolers, people that are kids that are parented peacefully, is they are whole and intact. It doesn't affect them when people judge them. It doesn't affect them in the way that it did us who were raised to be people pleasers. We were raised to, to please the adults around us or we couldn't have our needs you know, our desires met. So we jumped through hoops. We got good grades. We did everything we were told so we could have a little bit of freedom. And Man, is that hurts us so much as people to have to be raised that way. My kids will never have to deal with that. Yeah, and another thing that uh, public school teaches is obedience and deference to authority, right? And, and Larkin Rose uh, talks about this a lot that, um, you know, public school and also authoritarian parenting prepares kids for a life of state obedience. And, and is one of the reasons why, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, of people disobeying the orders of a police officer why it feels physically, viscerally painful to do that because that's how we were brought up. That's the programming that we had, you know, and it's so deeply ingrained that it's com it's inconceivable to not do that. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your um, your other book. You said you, you did a book on, um, on natural childbirth. Yeah, it's a, the title is a, a little risque, maybe. It's called Sexy Birth. Um, it raises a few eyebrows. Um, what it focuses on, though, is the aspect of um, the continuum of sexuality between conception and birth and how powerful um, the sexuality within us is during birth, that we're meant, it's meant to be a real um, sensual experience. And so when you can tap into that and you learn about it and you can, can birth from a place of trust and safety – Birth does not have to hurt. That's hugely important to share. That when there's no fear and there's just trust and love, that birth does not hurt like it does for most people. So the focus is on empowering and trusting women. And I share my four birth experiences, all very different. I share my last birth, which was um, attended but unassisted, which means that I birthed by myself. I had midwives downstairs to help me at the end with um, the end stuff. I won't get into gory details on your interview. I already <laughs> shared a few of them with you. I won't make them. Um, no but it was a wonderful experience to birth by myself and be in labor. I think when you have people there, even with a natural birth, like in a hospital or birth center, when you have a midwife or doula, oftentimes you do give away a lot of your power to them to help save you and rescue you and support you because 
that's what they're there for. So of course you just naturally kind of turn that over to them and like, help me, you're here. That's what you're here for. When you're alone and you're in labor, you, oh my gosh, you support yourself 30 million times better than you could with even the most naturally minded support. Mm -hmm. So when I was alone, man, I was, I was able to tap into places within myself that allowed me to relax and birth uh, virtually painlessly an 11 pound baby. Wow. If you would have told if you would have told me 15 years ago, I would have said you're crazy. I'm not one of those crazy hippie chicks, but you know what? <laughs> it it's amazing. It really worked. So, um yeah, a lot of what I share in the book might be a little radical for some people, but I encourage you to read it if you're pregnant or ex want to have a baby because you could definitely pull a little bit out of it um in every chapter too apply I, to your life. I just thought of a, a good title for your third book, which would be um, Kindness is Radical. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny you say that. We do a series on our, uh, we have a, we are, we're YouTube vloggers. Uh, we're with the Maker Network, which is a huge network, or the biggest network in the world of people that are vloggers. And we were recently joined them. And one of our series is called Radical Acts of Kindness. So every Wednesday, we put out a video based on um, kindness that we spread in different ways. And we love to do it as a family. It was something we did even before the series, so we started putting it out there. But it is radical, isn't it, to be kind to others? It's amazing. Are you revolutionary, you? That's I know that. <laughs> isn't that so funny? <laughs> what are you trying to do, upset the status quo? <laughs> I, I think I, I am. They, the status quo doesn't like me. I'm like enemy of the status quo. Yeah, enemy of the state. You know, I think that's a movie with Will Smith, but they should just graft you in. <laughs> I know, right? There's been a couple of funny, uh, like, memes out that say, fear the headband, you know, like, <laughs> the state fears this this young lady. Exactly. It's funny. Yeah, my, my wife, she had um, our two kids, uh, they were both water birth, and, you know, they were, they were attended by the same midwife. Uh, she was great. This woman, she had been... Um, a midwife for like um, 30, 32 years, and wow. she had birth helped helped to birth around three thousand babies. Wow! Like this one was amazing. this one was a powerhouse, and uh, and she had like you know her C section rate was like less than one percent, which was awesome, and and her and actually her her daughter who was living in California, uh, so we lived in uh, Long Island, right? So her daughter lived in California, and when she when her daughter was pregnant, you know she wanted her mother to help birth, you know, her birth her child. And then her mother's like, just find someone out there. Just there's other midwives. She's like, no, I want you. <laughs> and so she had to fly to California to help birth her two. Actually, I think she, she did both of her grandchildren. <laughs> That's of, awesome. That's so great. Amazing. Yeah. And so, so my wife, yeah, she did it in the, in the hospital first one. And then, and then, like you said, you know, um, she became, she felt more empowered uh, for the second one, so she didn't feel like she needed to be in the hospital, and so uh, we were at home, and we did, it was a water birth at home. It was just so beautiful, you know. You know, lights, you know, are dimmed, and you can have food and water if you want. You know, it's just I, I just don't understand. You know, I tell women that because I'm an acupuncturist, right? I used to work in an acupuncture clinic, and uh, and so I would see uh, you know a little bit of pregnant women, and I would ask them a lot. You know, what kind of childbirth are you going to do? And, oh, in the hospital. I'm like, have you considered water birth? You know, I talk to them a lot. And and most of them never don't know any anything about it, and so I tell them my wife's story, and and I just I just tell them that you know the water is it's just beautiful. It's just you know you can relax. You know when you go to the hospital, you have no freedom of choice, no no freedom of movement, nothing. Right, you are completely forfeiting your freedom to the other people. Right, and and and, and I'm sure you know about this the um, the sphincter law. I, I tell them about the sphincter law. <laughs> oh yeah, really awesome. I, I I say I say if you're in the bathroom and right and you're doing whatever you're doing right, pooping or peeing, and and like somebody's, you know, really um, wildly knocking on the door. Can you can you continue to go? <laughs> okay, now imagine yeah. you're a woman with your legs open, bright lights, strange people walking in and out. All right, how easy is it to birth a baby <laughs> in that situation? Yeah, I mean that's such an important thing to share. In my childbirth classes, I always ask the dads to go with the same kind of theme here. <laughs> I ask the dads like, how well would you do if you were having sex with your partner? And all of a sudden, the lights were turned on really bright. They strapped all these monitors on you, and they all were watching you with a notepad and just saying, okay, go ahead, finish. Go ahead. Do it. We're waiting, you know. And, like, how hard would it be for you to perform as a man in of that course. dynamic? It's the same thing. I mean, birth is sensual. It's part of this continu continuum of sexuality. You need privacy. You need the, the same energy and environment that was used to conceive the baby is what you need to birth the baby. And that's a, so important. 
Um, and so that's one thing I share. Uh, and once people hear it, it makes sense, doesn't it? They're like, wow, why didn't I ever look at it like that? But again, birth is big business, yeah. big, big business, man. They want your money. And the C-section rate's 30% in my area now, which is insane. Um, and people, th I think the sick thing about it is it's like birth rape to me. That's the way I look at it. Because not only will uh, somebody put you in major abdominal surgery, but you'll thank them for it. <laughs> you, you will thank the very people that caused you and your baby to be in this situation of life or death or something really intense um, and major abdominal surgery, you will then thank them. Thank you for saving me. And it's just <laughs> the biggest manipulating mind, whatever uh, <laughs> I can even think of. And so it's very important for me to educate people about exactly what you're talking about. Consumerism, that you are the consumer. And if you're going to birth in a hospital, you have many choices. You need a doula with you to be your advocate. You need someone to support you and get your wishes across. You can have a natural birth in a hospital. It's going to be much harder because liability is their top focus. Mm -hmm. um, and they're always thinking about themselves and their needs, not you. They, they just want to birth that baby in the way that will make them the most money to keep the hospital going and you're, yeah. So there's, that's another whole interview, isn't it, dude? It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I tell people, you know, the, the um, what, what is that called? The uh, obstetrical wing of, the, of most hospitals is like the most beautiful, you know? <laughs> it just, it's just mm -hmm. like, it, it looks wonderful because that's, what, that's the true money maker of the, of the hospital is, is the obstetrics wing, right? Uh, labor and delivery. So, right. so yeah, you're right. You know, they have all of these cascade of, of uh, interventions that they that they want to do, and uh, you know that just you know <laughs> it just pays their bills so much. That they, why would they not want you know you know that that's their that's their incentive is to do them not not to you know con be concerned with you know oh is is it going to be difficult for her recovering? How about with breastfeeding? Is that going to be difficult if I get you know if I do an unnecessary C section? <laughs> Right. I mean, if they do a C-section, they're covering themselves so much more and they, they know that because it's just the way the business is run. And these people that are in hospitals, nurses and doctors, however well-intentioned, they may not all have the focus on the money, but however well-intentioned, they were trained for medical birth. They were trained for emergencies and worst case scenarios and they approach birth as a medical condition. And so it's very important to realize that they do not have training in natural birth. None of them. In fact, my students, when they leave my class or people that read my book are better educated on natural birth than a doctor who's was went to school for years. Um, <laughs> so it's very, very important to take that responsibility into your own hands. And home birth is much, much safer. I recommend my friend Ricky Lake's movie, The Business of Being Born. She's uh, Some of you know Ricky Lake from being um, a TV personality, and she's put out a couple movies now, I incredible for like somebody who's coming from the mainstream um, to really understand. So I love that there's women like her that are celebrities that are willing to speak out about it. And times are changing, but it takes, and I, I love that you are a man and know this because I think a lot of women do, but we need men's voices to speak up for their wives and to speak up for the safety of their babies to be educated about this. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty true. I don't mean a lot of, uh, even women, I don't even mean a lot of women <laughs> that know right? about this stuff and don't forget about men. <laughs> I know, it's you know? crazy. Um, but, uh, but but yeah, I, I try to talk about it as much as possible with anyone I meet because you know the same thing with you know public schools and, and homeschooling and, and unschooling. There's so many myths and misconceptions to be demolished that um, there's just no time to waste. <laughs> so exactly. I don't you know wherever I am you know the grocery store at the playground at the library you know I try to spark up conversation with people about these things because um, and and I've gotten into some you know I, I've gotten people to think you know because they they. They really don't understand, you know, homeschooling and you know, breastfeeding and water birth and things like that. Um, and and yeah, that Ricky Lake movie actually, the uh, the business of being born. That's what that's what got us into it a lot. I think. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh! I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's awesome. And then we and then we checked out the um, I think it was more more business of being born. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then and then my my wife got. Uh, some of um, Ina Mae Gaskin's books. Oh, I love her. She's amazing. Yeah, Ina Mae. yeah. We yep. got. Uh, so she was reading up on it. She, my wife. Yeah, she read up a lot on breastfeeding, and and so and so. You know, with with my wife, when she wants me to read something, 
she just like puts it in the bathroom because that's my reading time. <laughs> <laughs> Why do guys read in the bathroom? I don't understand that. My husband does the same thing as like photography magazines. I'm like, that's the last place I think I'd want to read a book. But hey. Oh my God, it's the best, you know, especially with, ki- especially with kids. I mean, I think it works better with a father. You can just lock the door. But my, my wife complains, even if she locks the door, the kids eventually yeah. break it down and like come inside. The bathroom becomes a public event when you're a mother. As a, as- I've, I've breastfed while on the toilet, but yeah. I've never read. <laughs> I mean, it's it's amazing. Yeah, my wife, you know, she she kind of uh, laments. You know, I have no freedom, no free time anymore. I mean, yeah, it's true. That's that's one of the that's one of the trade offs. You know, you gotta <laughs> people yep. people should be um, educated about. You know, this is what happens when you have kids. <laughs> so you're not surprised, yeah. right? <laughs> Definitely, and it's hard to learn ways. Honestly, as women, as new mothers, and your wife being a new mother. I mean, even though you have a four year old, it's still a new uh, thing. It's really hard to find ways to meet our own needs. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges is taking responsibility to meet your own need as a parent on this path. Because martyrdom is like, it used to be virtuous back when I was a kid. If you were a martyr, I mean, that's what you saw on TV. Women were martyrs and they were just praised for it. However, it's not virtuous. It's really damaging because you're modeling for your kids that you don't take care of yourself and you put other people first. I want my kids to have that empowerment to meet their own needs. So I have to find ways. And the hardest thing I do actually is meeting my own needs. It's easy to ignore my needs because it's what was done to me (laughs) my whole life. So saying, you know what, I need a break. I have to just stop and chill and um, have a cup of tea or read a magazine or do something to expand myself, whether it's a yoga class or art or a new recipe or whatever my passion is. It's so important to nurture that. So we need to remind ourselves as parents that you have to do what they say on the airplane, man. When that oxygen tank comes down, you have to give it to yourself first mm. or you're never going to help anyone else yeah. in the way that they deserve. So that's important. Yeah, Definitely. yeah. My, my wife has recently gotten into yoga. Uh, I think twice a week she's been going, which is really good, you know, for get get away and just do something by herself. And uh, Definitely. You know, I, uh, I support that. Definitely. And, and another thing I even support, even before we had kids, this is, it goes into a little bit of relationships, but... You know, um, I I completely trusted my wife, right? And she had a lot of male friends in her in her university, and I had absolutely no problem with her going to dinner with them. You know, they would call her up. You know, Monica, you want to you want to go out dinner? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> and I tell that to people, and they're like, "You let your wife go by herself with a guy?" <laughs> it's yeah. All, it's all about trust. How much do you trust the person that you're with, right? And if you yeah. don't trust them, how far is your relationship going to go, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge journey of growth on this path because once you start it with parenting, it does affect every other area of your life. And learning that trust and uh, freedom is ultimately the way to happiness, it does challenge those situations. So I've been, you know, my husband and I have been married 20 years, June this June. We've been together since I was 15 and him 17. And we've grown so much as people and we do it together but it's hard at times so it takes that patience and working things out and, and talking a lot um, about our in, our beliefs and philosophy so we're never done this is a journey it's yeah. not a, it's not an end uh, something with an end we're constantly growing and constantly on this journey so yeah, it's unique it, to all of us yeah for me Monica um, yeah we yeah I met we met uh, when we were 17 actually <laughs> it's kind of interesting yeah uh, so so yeah we've been together yeah about um, what, what's that 15 years 16 years and um, and so but with Monica this type of parenting and the and the, the you know the the unschooling the homeschooling it's difficult for her because she came from communist Romania right so she was Thoroughly, and you know, talk about authoritarian upbringing and education, you know, wow, and yeah. schooling. Like, like you know, it, it was still acceptable for the teachers to, you know, to hit the kids. You know, with you know, they put out their hands like this, and they hit them with the, uh, uh, you know, the ruler. Um, you know, it, it, it's still acceptable for things like that. And 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 you know, when uh, if the the troops would come by, you know, the soldiers they would have to go out, stand firmly, rigidly in a straight line, and. And they couldn't, you know, Monica, she remembers being really, really scared when the troops would come around and they would just look at them and laugh, laugh at the kids for being, you know, it's, it's just. Wow, that's incredible. I, um, times are changing. It's amazing. Even over there, I was recently invited to be the keynote speaker at an unschooling event in, in Poland. And I was like, wow, wow. this is spreading. This cool. is spreading fast. It really kind of made me stop and think. Um, 
That's incredible. So, wow. That your wife's been through a lot. Boy, can she speak on yeah. things that we don't have the experience with. Yeah, yeah. So, and so as a, as a result of that, she it's really difficult for her to to understand, you know, raising, uh, you know, your children and also looking at um, education from the aspect of, you know, complete n- n- no, um, how you say, structure, ab- you know, absolutely no structure whatsoever. You know, just allow them the freedom to pursue their interests. That's kind of, it's so foreign, even more than for me. <laughs> she's, still, uh-huh. she's still kind of struggling with that. Um, so, so what about with you and your husband? Is, is, is it more difficult for one of you, was it more difficult for one of you to grasp that? Um, Not with the educational side. The parenting side, I think oftentimes, and not to be, to say that men and women are totally different, but there is some different components of our genders. And depending upon how we were raised, um, when Devin, my my 15-year-old, my firstborn was two, I remember reading up on this and learning more about partnership parenting. And it was making so much sense. I used to print off little quotes and stick them all over the house, like inside the medicine cabinet. He'd get his toothbrush and there would be a quote um, about positive parenting. He really was on board from the beginning. He understood it. He was always supportive of uh, the family bed, of extended breastfeeding. He's been my biggest supporter in everything. However, he did go through a process of mourning his own childhood. I wrote about it in my book where he said to me once, like, I totally get what you want to do and I agree with it. However, there is this part of me that is mourning the loss of what I thought would be. I had to obey my whole life, mm-hmm. everybody around me, and I thought when I was a father, it'd finally be my turn. Like, yay, now I finally get to be obeyed, oh, and now God. you're telling me that that's not our focus, and I have to just honor that part of me that's going, wow, I've been waiting finally to to be able to control others, and now oh. that's not how we're living. And so it was a very honest, vulnerable thing that he said, it's not something he wanted to do on a, on a conscious level. However, that part of him that was so disrespected and lived in such unjust, um, and not to blame the people, his parents, I mean, they did what they knew, but it was hard for him in the beginning to just be like, okay, that's never going to happen for me. I had to go through all that, and this is not how I heal, by to force somebody else to do what I want, like I had to live. So... I think a lot of us go through that sometimes. Like it feels unfair. Like you just want to stomp your feet and be a little kid and again and be like, this sucks. Like I hate, I, it's hard to friggin' find compromise. It's hard to focus on everyone's needs. It's a lot. I just want everyone to listen to me today and do what I say. And um, yeah. that's not, that's not the life we're leading. So I just want people to know the, the, the realistic emotions that do come up for all of us on this path. Um, in the long run, it's going to be a much more functional life. We're going to have great relationships with our kids. Our grandkids aren't going to have to go through um, these kind of things. Our kids are not going to spend their whole lives looking to heal from the first two decades of their life. They are going to be whole and intact. And in turn, I'd like to think that this is an investment. Um, I don't have grandkids yet or adult children. But someday, I know in my heart, I'm going to say, see, <laughs> this is so much better than I mean, having kids. I mean, know. regardless, if you have grandchildren, it's just humane and moral to treat exactly. human beings with respect and kindness and compassion, right? Oh, on so many levels, you I know? get it. And, you know, I, the, the relationship we have with our kids now uh, is not, like nothing I've ever seen um, and experienced. My kids are our best friends. We love them. They love to be with us, and we're very close and connected, and it's paid off from the beginning to see their wholeness. But there is those broken parts of us, mm-hmm. still from our childhood, that sometimes you don't know where to go with the feelings. And so that's the journey, you know. We may be okay on the outside, but on the inside, a lot of us have stuff we're working on because of it. And, and you know what that that uh, admission that your husband made, what that reminded me of was um, the idea that we have to break the cycle of violence. That, yeah. you know, we were raised violently, and so we have, you know, <laughs> we have to raise our kids violently so that they can raise their kids violently. And when does it end? <laughs> right? right, and so those of us that are doing this are honestly in my heart, I say this all the time, that we are pioneers on the leading edge of this new um, way of being. And it, we have one foot in each paradigm. And it is hard sometimes. Um, but we're doing it for our kids and for future generations. And I'm willing to, to go through the emotional roller coaster and um, really needing to reprogram myself and how I was raised versus how I'm parenting. So we are doing a lot of work for future generations and people like you and your wife are pioneers and I applaud you and I thank you for helping helping shift the world. Yes. Yes, it's a <clears throat> yeah, it, it can be lonely at times and and you know you feel ostracized and isolated from your your peers and friends but 
but um, you know, I have to remind myself why why we're doing this. You know, that there's a good reason for it, and it's not it's not because it's popular or to make more friends, right? It's because it's right. it's right and it's moral way, way to treat other people, not just not just your friends and family, but little people, right? We're also right. people. You know, they're exactly. not they're not just like things. Your pro they're not your property that you can do with what you want. <laughs> you know? Exactly, exactly. And I, I love that more and more awareness is being raised surrounding that. So it's a very, very important time in human history. It wasn't very long ago that men were told to beat their wives when dinner wasn't on the table on time. It wasn't long ago that we men were told by their friends and their fathers to control their women and make them obey. It really wasn't historically. Mm -hmm. So much has happened since th those times with the women marching for their rights, women being able to vote. It wasn't very long ago. And so human rights have evolved, and the same is happening with children right now. And those of us that are voices for children's rights and freedoms, um, we're going to get that pushback from people that don't want change. But we will look back on this time when we have grandkids or great-grandkids someday and say, I can't believe that children used to be just treated that way. I can't believe we used to force kids to obey us because evolution expansion is happening, and this will be looked back on is a really interesting time in human history and it will be in books history books yeah and, and just you know the like you said the advancement the um you know the the moral and ethical advancement of of the human consciousness you know where you know the the way we look at you know um the mass the slave masters of the 1800s and the way we look at you know the 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 people you know who are, who were keeping the you know let's say blacks downtrodden or, or let's say kkk members is the same way that the future generations will look at those people who engaged in spanking, corporal punishment, and sending their kids off to public school. Is, yes, you know, exactly. <laughs> is that it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it makes you think. Like, because these parents that are doing that, a lot of them don't know there's a choice. So back in those days with oppression on so many levels with minorities and women, like when pe if people don't know there's a choice, who is to blame? Well, people are to blame when they know what, what people that are listening to this interview right now, you, you, ha you can't go back. There is no de-evolving from knowing what you know now and seeing through this filter of this paradigm. And so I think we just have to keep speaking about it. And when people hear it, um, they can't make up the excuse anymore. I had the excuse that I just didn't know. I did the best I could. Well, we are showing you a better way. Um, I don't believe this is just a different way. This is surely a better way to raise um, awareness and bring more peace and love into the world. So um, it's an honor to be speaking about it. Beautiful. <laughs> well, I don't want to keep you too long. This is uh, a <laughs> we're, we're approaching on the hour. So, so why don't you let people know where they can find your work, what websites they can contact you? Sure. Um, well, I have a website for my um, articles, and I have a lot of videos and interviews on there. Um, it's danamartin.com. So D A Y N A M A R T I N dot com. And then I and you can also contact me for speaking engagements and different things like that. I'm happy to speak anywhere that somebody wants to hear what I have to say. Um, and then I have a family blog that I've kept for over 10 years. Isn't that incredible? I remember when I started it, I just did it to share some fun things my kids were drawing. That's how it all started. <laughs> but that is um, the Sparkling Martins, uh, T-H-E, sparklingmartins.blogspot.com. And then we have a vlog uh, that's new for us this year on YouTube, which has been the most incredible response, actually. Um, everything started for me on YouTube. I uploaded the first ever video nine years ago about unschooling on YouTube before YouTube was even big I didn't nobody knew what it was hmm. and I did a whole U unschooling series and it started everything for me advocacy wise so now I like to think about coming full circle that I'm back to YouTube um, my initial home for advocacy hmm. and so we do every day we upload a video and it's sometimes it's a family vlog sometimes it's fun sometimes it has to do with parenting and unschooling or other days it just might be a peek into our crazy life <laughs> and um, yeah so that is the sparkling Martins on YouTube Beautiful, and and uh, and we, can you leave our the audience with some uh, a message they can uh, they can take home with them? <laughs> yeah, I would love to. Um, if I could say just a few things for you to remember from this conversation, it would be: um, don't focus on your child's behavior like our culture does. Don't try to control or manipulate it. Focus on the needs under the behavior. Just that one change in parenting that these are people, human beings with needs that will change everything and also the final thing to say is uh, assume positive intent assume positive intent from people in your life and it will completely change your reality um, assume positive intent from your kids and everybody you love so if anybody needs support I offer parenting coaching and I use a sliding scale I won't turn anyone away 
um, just contact me through my website. I'm happy to schedule something for you. And I want to offer you and your wife a coaching session for free. Oh, um, oh, just you. for because I believe in you guys and what you're doing is awesome. And I want more people to know who you are. And I want to just support anybody who wants to walk on this path as an advocate. So you just let me know if you ever need that. Or maybe oh, you just beautiful. want a conversation just to share um, some struggles because we need each other. We're, we're, we're surely not perfect parents, even though we're sharing an ideal that we strive for. There's times where we have moments that it's really hard and need support. So we all need to support each other. Yeah, definitely. I, I, you know, talking about you know our past and how how that reverberates in the way we parent. You know, I see myself in my father, the way he you know raised me, and uh, you know the shouting and impatience and you know things like that. And I mean, I mean, I was um, you know you know he would you know not not spanking, but like you know pulling the hair and smacking things like oh, that. Oh yeah. So mm-hmm. so of course I don't do that, but. But the other things like, you know, raising your voice and, uh, and just, yeah, becoming impatient, that's, it's so hard to get over that. And I find, I see myself doing a lot of that and I just have to, it's, it's so hard to calm down and ask, you know, you know, in a calm and collected tone, you know, what happened and, you know, explain and do reasoning and negotiation, <clears throat> but we have to do it, right? If, if we yeah. really want to see change, fundamental change in the world, you have to start with the children. Because they're going to be the future <laughs> of the of the world of tomorrow, right? Yeah, and this is the hardest generation, or, or what we're doing right now. Because, like I said, you have one foot in each paradigm. What I find, if I do act in a way that I'm not proud of, or isn't in alignment philosophically with what I believe, I always apologize, um, and you get a do-over. You know, I say to my kids, "I'm sorry. I really didn't mean to treat you that way. I'm tired, or hungry, or mm-hmm. I just wasn't in a place of responding from a from presence and." Consciously, so apologizing when you are a certain way is so important, and I think that our kids are very forgiving. They understand that this isn't easy when you talk to them about it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, well, thank you for sharing that and that vulnerability of kind of admitting that none of us are perfect, even though we're advocates. We're trying our best, and we're here to help you. We're here to support you and share what we do when we make mistakes. So beautiful, yes, awesome. awesome. I love, the, love the message. Thank you very much, Dana, for, thank the, you. for the opportunity, the interview. Uh, so this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Conscious Resistance Network. Uh, wish everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye.